fucking spiders. Moving out 19, my experience and tips. So you want to move out. If you're afraid you really should not be, this is a video here to give you a bit of comfort, understand how to tackle some specific issues such as housing options in comparison in between rental and mortgages, benefit and disadvantages to both, income methods, and give you a bit of overview for what it feels like to moving out for the first time with a budget for what I reckon is below average. The video covers through a range of things including all in depth details about all the popular job options, the different pay rates for different age groups, and the rates of loading from Saturday, Sunday and the afternoon shifts, all from popular companies such as Burger King slash Hungry Jacks in Australia, Coles and Woolworths. The timestamps will be in the description below, so if you're looking for something specific or want to watch some information, that will be an option as well. I don't understand why for the longest time, but from personal experience, people just make it sound so much more scary than it needs to be. This this typical image of a college student barely able to afford rents, can only afford cups of noodles, stealing toilet paper from the workplace, or wiping the bums with the bare hands. Which I can definitely tell you is not yet remotely true. Even while planning to move out, the legit 30, 40 olds are keep on telling me things like, you have no idea how hard life is, man. Oh, you have no idea how hard life really is, man. As well as some of those are the most obnoxious things I ever heard in my life. And I honestly have no idea where it's coming from. From even the perspective of someone with one of the lowest incomes in my social group, I just want to start a video by saying that the outside world is nowhere near scary as what people tell you to be. You get up some friends, you have a job or two or three or four. The main thing though I reckon is at least one permanent source of income. I think that's pretty stable good advice for overall general things. Before going further in the video, I just want to mention my current living situation is that we share houses with my co-workers, so that's my individual experience that I've been sharing today. I have no classmates which have brought own houses at age 16, but I'm sadly just not one them. This is my experiences and the tips for me to give. While planning to move out, I was honestly a bit afraid. I honestly had some pretty bad experiences beforehand sharing a house with people. Although it's often the cheapest option, it's most likely not the one I want to go for. I've seen people not wash the dishes and slipping all the pots and everything out there without a care. I've seen toilets and floors covered in urine with no one cleaning it. I've seen people just randomly bringing others in and it's kind of just stayed there for a while. So the houses are often just constantly over flooded with people. Some people do steal stuff. If they see a drink they might like or see a bag of frozen seafood, they might just want to help themselves to a portion of it. It's like a house of 5 million people, God knows who has taken it. And on rare occasions, incidents do happen so mistakes do occur. Most of the shit houses only have one shared fridge, which I feel like is never enough. And for some insane reason, there's always this one person that likes to park inside the garage, so that's one more storage option out the window. Especially dealing with the younger generation or living inside a bad neighborhood where the rent is cheaper, walk 5 miles down to the north slash south, a bit more than South Australia, and you get a line of drug deals. So ideally then, you want to get inside a middle class neighborhood for safety reasons. That the option often comes with a cost in the form of, um, well, money. With the recent inflation, rent prices around the areas I want to live in range from $300 weekly on the absolute lowest, going up to the 450s on the middle classes, all the way to 1000 extra on the nicer homes. I drive from my work, so some of the cheaper options units in the city, which you can find for $230 a week, are not available to me. Some single room units, including parking, could be found for $250 a week, and share houses for single rooms are usually $220 to $300. So, single room units were a pretty good deal alongside studio apartments, although one is slight issue. Although $250 a week is not bad in the context that was given, it's still a lot of money. Considering that's the cost before all the water, electrical feeds, and whatever else you might have it. And still, 250 alone is still a lot of money. As a general rule, I want a single week worth of rent to be made within a single day. Preferably half a day if I can get away with that. Rent is rent, and you're only paying to be staying there. And I much prefer the money to be reinvested into actual property, serving as an actual piece of asset instead of a liability. Then, all of a sudden, it came to me. Why don't I just mortgage instead? An older unit can be fined around $250,000 with two bedrooms. Taking on a mortgage would mean paying around $220 weekly. The price itself is literally the same or less as renting a single room from some no name house from the 1920s. This is good. This means I can rent one of the rooms out for $190 or $200 a week, and it will be a literal steal on the current market. Meaning, if I live there, I can just pay $20 a week for the mortgage alone while investing towards earning an actual piece of assets. Older units does tend to have a tendency where they have bad inflation, but historically though, they should still increase a bit of value over time, so I shouldn't lose any money if I do decide to sell it in the future. I actually gave a few offers with this idea in mind, and I was quite confident in the idea too. The issue with it though is that nobody accepts my offer and I'd have no idea why. I think it might be my age that plays a factor as they think I'd not be financially reliable or not have enough years working. I don't actually know the reason. 
Another thing is that people always increase the prices after I send in an offer before dropping the price of the one I initially offer for and give the offer to someone else instead. I have no idea what this is supposed to mean. A sign up before I go into things further, if you're female, female, female only shared units or houses can be a really good deal which can cost less than regular renting. I think I saw some of 170 to 150 a week before when I was scouting around. Another side note is that university support accommodations are also great. There are some housing around some Pacific universities where if you're currently studying in that uni and you rent places, these are usually a bit cheaper than regular renting. Talking to people that I know that is accepting this current option seems to be around $200 a week without including water or electrical or gas bills which are shared around the house. One more additional option for housing are cost down poor housing, I'm not sure how to frame this, I don't actually remember the exact name for what it's called, but on rare occasions though there are organizations which will provide housing rentals for a lower price than what it's actually worth. I've seen a beautiful house before with for the whole thing, it was just 250 a week, or thing, I think it might be 270 a week if I remember correctly, still it was way too much. But for like a two person share or a family share, it would be a banger. This sort of housing does come with their own specific agreements and also requirements. Well, I think one of the agreements was that you had to be earning less than $31,000 a year. So really it's more like a charity sort of thing for the lower income brackets of families. Going somewhat back on topic though, when I was in consideration for buying properties, I was in the mindset of continuing onwards of studying. I think I could have afforded a $330,000 mortgage if I was going full on working. But I really didn't want the pressure and it has been pretty speculated the housing will be on a decline within the upcoming half a year or so. So I was really considering the more unit options more as they don't really decline or inflate all that much, especially with the older ones. It really is these sort of things where being a single absolutely sucks. So a co-worker of mine just bought a house while I was looking for a place to move in and when they say they were also looking for someone else to help them pay the mortgaging and to live in, I was like yeah sure, I can definitely do that. This way I can get the low payments for just renting quote quote a single room. I am supporting a friend instead of a no name and I am with someone that I can trust and take through from. My co-worker actually offered me a supply of furnishing as well, which is nice but after feeling the mattress and seeing some of the furnishing, I said no. In the following three months though, I spent upwards of $10,000 setting everything up. It really is in the beginning where the money just kind of floods out like kind of water. Just about everything inside this room and a good amount of things outside this room are all completely brand new and brought by me. This includes a PC, monitor, mouse, shelves, beds, all the blankets, a good amount of clothing. Ah uh, yes, that's right, I had to buy extra clothing, heaters, lights, knives, cookware, cleaning items, bins, printer, fans, floor mattresses, just going off my head. Although all these items are not particularly expensive, but added up, they are quite a sum. I brought most of these items from either Kmart or Ikea, which helped to save a bunch of money. I think the mattress plus the frame itself for the bed, which is shy of $200, which is an incredible price. I honestly don't get why people bang on Ikea beds that much. Especially the Ikea mattresses, they're so bang for the buck. I typically change them every 2-3 to three years, but they're so cheap it's really not an issue. Especially compared to what I used to have, which is around $2,000 or something brand new, from a super fancy large special mattress store. Ever since I moved in though, I've actually been cooking a lot more. I've been experimenting with a lot of my diet and I've been feeling much nicer since. I had transitioned from white rice to brown rice to cauliflower rice by the end of it. I feel like the white rice works horribly with my body so I've been switching out that. Brown rice is actually great, I feel the best eating it, but in Australia though the acidic levels is like 2 times over the European safety standards and I don't quite fancy skin or bladder cancer just yet. I believe the safe consumption amount for brown rice is about 2 times a week. I eat rice about 10 to 14 times a week, so that was an issue. A simple way to decrease the acidic levels in brown rice I was at 50% is to first rinse it with warm water, then coat the rice with much more water than you used to use. Afterwards though, simply just empty up the water and enjoy the rice by itself. Finally, we had the cauliflower rice. It has still more nutritional values than even brown rice, and I kind of see it as a cancer-free version of brown rice for me. Although cauliflower rice should have less calories than brown rice, I do notice a much better fat loss with brown rice. I honestly not sure why, and at this point I'm too afraid to ask. My typical diet consists of cauliflower rice, onions, carrots, Chinese veggies, chicken, lamb, seafood, and almond milk. My comfort food is salmon. I eat salmon typically around 8 to 10 pounds a week. Salmon is high in unsaturated fats. These are healthy fats which the body does need but does not produce naturally. And to name a few of the aspects of salmon which draws me in are the vitamin B12 and magnesium alongside a lot of minerals which is great for the nervous system. The lack of vitamin B12 and magnesium can cause high levels of fatigue. 
as I add a bonus, I also have around 300 ml of almond milk a day. The main two options which I found to be good. The standard Coast brand coming at $1.20 and the So Good brand at $3. Both contains unsaturated fats, calcium, B12, magnesium, and vitamin A. I won't go into food depth details for what I eat, but as a general mindset, I go with whenever I choose food. In short as well, onion and cauliflower rice are also very good for you. I probably spend a bit over $150 a week on food and drinks. I used to have a habit of getting bottled drinks as you pour carry sweat in carpets. Exchanging them out with green tea instead has helped me to save a sizable chunk of money. Alright, let's talk about time management and habit changes. In this aspect, I'm pretty much like everybody else. I work, I study, and have things I want to do. Ever since I moved out, I plan my day out like the way I want to, without having to worry about my parents suddenly having urges to start a conference inside my room at 3am in the morning, complaining about how I'm not sleeping, whilst they clearly aren't either. A small thing which has made my life a lot more comfortable is decreasing my main meals to just two. So instead of cooking twice a day, I just continue to cook the once. This has allowed me to save an additional 30 more minutes in sleeping, or 45 minutes in sleep, which has helped me immensely with anxiety and has allowed me to perform much better during the day. Ever since I moved out, I dropped the amount of times of eating outside quite drastically. I used to eat I used to eat out every single day. Vietnamese, Korean, and Chinese were the quick options which I went for instead of fast food. Even in fast food, things like Domino's I found to be quite nice alongside the burgers from fish and chip shops, which I do notice they have a larger proportion of veggies. And the food there generally just feels more clean. The reason why I decrease eating out more and more now is generally because the food around my area is just getting worse and worse. I remember being able to get things around $14 before the government started printing out money in the tons and the food is generally less healthy now. I noticed more spices have been placed inside the food serve so it's generally less healthy and the rice grain slash noodles used are not the ideal types I want to eat. That being said though, some of the smaller restaurants in the small streets still carry some absolute amazing value. So, so if we get a chance to definitely look in those places instead of eating fast food. For all those that want to eat healthier but low on time, Meal replacement drinks that aren't a bad option. A brand I quite fancy is called Ozilant. I'll try to remember to add the link in the description below so you can order some as well. These aren't really like the more popular weight loss drinks and are designed to be eaten alongside something else. For me, I recommend carrying two apples and a banana. The drinks contain essential minerals and vitamins including iron, magnesium, calcium, and a rate of vitamins including B12, which can express symptoms of dementia if you are too low on it. For a period of time, I consider either cooking all the food I need once a week, and just leaving all the cooked food inside the freezer and just warming everything up whenever I needed it. I hate the idea of using, I hate the idea of eating secondhand food for dinner. It's not for me, but it might work for you. This method is more effective for meat eating based diets than the mostly seafood one for me. Cooking food and doing laundry is somehow one of the most main things people always mention whenever you're moving out and how like this near impossible task you have to face every single day. I save my clothing up in the container with a large bag inside of it and I wash it every 2-3 to three days or so. And for food I found eating frozen bagged food quite easy. Things like frozen salmon, frozen veggies, frozen squid are all very nice that all carry brilliant nutritional value and the taste still remains quite nicely. I never got why I always get insulted by literally everyone, as they assume I just eat junk foods all day, taking things from McDonald's, and sipping fast noodles like the holy grail for all solutions. Please stop. I'm not that rich and delusional. Frozen foods are really easy to bear, just chuck in the freezer and just use it whenever you want to. I find that really helpful for fast preparations and highly nutritional. Alright, let's talk about incomes and workloads. People make incomes as a major thing whenever moving out, and I can definitely say even if you're studying, you can probably have enough income just working passively. I definitely seen people work and study full time before. I definitely know it's possible. I'm one of those people right now as speaking, studying full time nursing and also working as a disability worker. So in this session is where we're going to be tackling around the older paychecks. This includes fast food, supermarkets, disability a bit as well. Keep in mind though, all these data is gonna be pre um, pay rise, so there might be a dollar behind the actual rate is right now. I think I wrote this script right on the pay rise that happened. So a new document hasn't arrived to me just yet. Just like anyone else though when I started my employment, I didn't know much about anything. For me, I was always a study person. I was always I was always isolated from the real world and consider money or making money until it was really the age of 18 or so when I started thinking about everything. 
In South Australia, being a casual fast food worker age 18 usually earns around $20 an hour. For the Australian branded Burger King Hungry Jacks, that's $19.58 an hour, and for McDonald's, that's a dollar extra, I believe. These jobs start you off with your hours and slowly build you up over time. But the first year, you get a good amount of work. Even as a casual, you get a timetable about two weeks ahead of time, which is quite nice. And by your second year, you'll be pretty set on hours. A downside of this aspect though is that the weekend loading isn't great. From what I understand, it's only about $4 extra loading for both Saturdays and Sundays, with an additional $2 more if you're working in between 10 pm and 12 pm for any day of the week. Another thing with fast food though, as well, is that it can be drastically different from store to store depending on management. I was once a supervisor for a 19 year old which mentioned she was only paid $14 an hour as a casual and she was been working there for like 2 years. I mean yeah, if you search out the medium earnings for fast food employees, it's about $14 which makes sense I suppose. With one slight issue though, it's literally illegal. The absolute lowest you can pay someone in South Australia for a 19 year old is $20.70 an hour and if you're 18 year old, you're legally required to be paid at least $18.11. So do be really careful on that aspect. I actually talked her into having a chat with a manager about the topic and she actually ended up getting a pay rise to $22 I think, which is nice and a bit more fairer considering she was a senior worker there as well. A good thing about fast food though is that according to this graph, a good percentage of people from fast food do end up as nuclear medicine technologists which do get paid pretty well apparently. On the other side of things though, two markets, especially Woolworths are a much better alternative to fast food. Woolworths targets older employers more, so if you're 18 and older, that's the direction I would head towards. The first year of employment starts at $21.05 as a permanent and with an extra 25% loading for casuals, your starting pay rate will be $26.30 an hour at least according to supposedly confidential documents and this other most likely confidential document. If you are 20 or older, for 19 year olds, you're getting 80% of that pay, for 18 year olds, you're getting 70% of that pay, for 17 year olds, that's 60%, for 16 year olds, that's 50% of that pay. Both Coles and Woolworths carries an additional 15% extra loading for afternoon shifts and also Saturdays. Afternoon slash evening loading starts from 6pm onwards, so do keep that in mind. On Sundays though, from midnight to 9am, you are given an additional 100% loading for casual and 125% for permanent workers. On Sundays from 9am to 11pm is additional 50% extra loading and from 11pm to midnight is additional 100% extra loading again for the casuals. So let's say you're 18, so you earn 70% of the hourly pay. Let's use the starting pay, which is $21.05, times 1.25, 25% extra loading, times 0 0.7, so taking off 70%. So that will be $18.41 will be your standard hourly pay. Chances are, when you're 18, you might not even finish school yet, or you might not have finished uni, so you'll be working mainly in the afternoons. So if you're afternoon loading, which is an additional 15% extra, that's $21.18 an hour. Let's take a look at the Sundays with 100% loading from midnight to 9am, which will be $36.82 an hour, and the standard 9am to 11pm will be $27.6015. So let's say you're 19, so you earn 80% pay. 21.5 that's a base starting rate times 0 0.8 times 1.25 times 1.15 for the extra afternoon loading. So that's $24.5 an hour for the afternoons. For Sunday shifts from midnight to 9am, you can be expecting $42.10 an hour. The typical 9am to 11pm, that is $32.25. The pay really does get better as you age. If you're 20, you're older than me, so you can calculate all this stuff on your own, so good luck. But yeah, working at Woolworths or Coles is really not that bad of a job, and truly is so much better than fast food, especially 20 and older. If you combine both fast food and also supermarkets together, you can get a pretty good income. So which of the options did I choose eventually? The answer was health, surprisingly. I was 18 at the time, and just spent choosing either fast food or supermarket would mean I am in disadvantage in payments. Fast food and supermarkets don't really teach so much stuff, which will be an issue on the long run, and I run into the risk where I can easily be replaceable. I could invest my time into trade, I suppose, but the annoying thing with that though is that you are required to start off as apprentice after the cert 2 before heading into cert 3. Trying to find someone to teach you things and pay for you everything is a bit of a pain but can definitely be done I suppose. The main issue at the time was that I was really physically and mentally ill and I have fear of heights. Not great combinations I say. After dropping out of uni, I decided to head into health as a support worker. There's a few main reasons for this. 
The first is the COVID situation and is a high demand for support workers. The second was that the funding from disability aged care are mostly provided by government, especially in high care. So the job should be reasonably secure even if the whole financial situation just goes downhill. The third was salary packaging. I won't get into details that much, but, it's, but essentially it can take $18,000 of tax with each employer that you have. I currently have three jobs, so that means I basically pay little to no tax. Although it's not as magical as what I said right there, it's still a large benefit for why people go into this profession in the first place, especially if it's someone that's currently mortgaging. The plan went mostly as I hoped. I got into a job after a three month course and was offered a permanent position at the start. The pay currently starts at $31.46 an hour, though the downside is that I don't really have many hours a day, only 6 hours a day from Monday to Friday without many weekend shifts. Due to this, I put my HK certification out for casual community support. I think HK starts at $24 an hour, so if you're considering HK, I honestly think that going to the market is a better option instead. That's especially true if you're considering HK accommodation, the high care dementia units can be really rough at times. The HK community option is a much better option in my opinion, and for my community job for HK, it's usually just a 2 hour shift of relaxation from my way back home from my disability job to do some cleaning or some transport. Since my HK is only in the afternoons, that means an additional 15% extra loading plus my initial 25% extra loading for being casual, getting paid $34.56 an hour. On Sundays, I work as a remedial massage therapist. In total, I work 33.5 hours a week, which equals to an amount of about $1,000. Sometimes I get higher numbers if I decide to take on extra shifts, but that's a guarantee amount I get each week. I think having at least one permanent source of income is a great idea, and with only 6 hours a day at work, I still get a good amount of sunshine without needing to wake up too early, which is again, great for my health. The downside to my current job is that the timetables are fixed. This means now that I have taken on studying again, I am losing two days of my permanent job a week, so I'm currently only working just four days or so. Even so that's the case though, I find that I have enough to get by with no comfort loss, which is kinda nice. I know someone which worked for fast food and also supermarket full time whilst attending full time uni as well, which even earned more than me when I was full on working. For more options though, you can look into cleaning which is about $28 an hour. A friend of mine used to earn 80k a year whilst attending high school, just helping gyms around the corner do Facebook promotions, which if that's something you're good at though, that's also an idea for you. If you're a physical person though, trade is a great option. You can get paid 29,000 an hour in trade as an apprentice, and your employer will help you pay all the study fees. Some people I knew did sport coaching as well, if you're a business person you also look into it. 